So good afternoon, and it's a pleasure for me uh, to give this keynote presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about an important topic for all of us, overweight and obesity. Just to see where we have come from. In 1980, we had about 857 million persons who were overweight or obese. In currently, 2018, it's about 2.1 billion. And we have seen that one of the drivers is unhealthy diet. There is something to also note that we've mentioned our food systems being a problem and there is need for transformation. That if we do not do this transformation, this will be the first in human history when the next generation will have a shorter lifespan than their parents. This is quite serious if we should get to this. I think I'll skip this, we've seen them. Let's go straight to the problem. Over the years, overweight and obesity, as you can see from the graphs, are increasing in both men and women. And it is important to note that at any time point, the prevalence is higher in women than in men. Now this figure shows the prevalence but disaggregated by regions for overweight and obesity. It is important to note in Africa that the situation is disproportionately higher in women than in men, and I will address this later. Now, children have not been saved from being been spared from this. It's also catching up among women, among uh, children and adolescents. So here, the numbers are increasing in all regions. You can see the red going up over the, uh, the years in Africa, the yellow also going up uh, in Latin, uh, in Asia. The numbers are actually increasing in all regions. Okay. And the trend, uh, we see the trend here, sorry. We see the trend is increasing. You know, um, the prevalence in children is increasing and adolescent is increasing. Okay, so this just confirms what we have just seen previously. What are the conceptual drivers behind this problem? Uh, we have been talking about food systems, food systems, food systems. I just want to take a few minutes to make sure that we all have a common understanding by what we mean by food systems. Uh, it's very complex. It's not a very simple thing when we talk about food systems, but we've reduced it to this very simple diagram. And this diagram shows that within a food system, so within a food system, we are talking about production, processing, all the way consumption to disposal. That is the outer part, the food system. Now the foods that are produced then go into what we call the food environment. Now the food environment is where you reach out and select your foods. And that environment around you is affected by accessibility, availability, your preferences, because we all choose foods according to our preferences. It's also affected by regulations, standards, because those regulations will influence what comes into the food environment. And it's also affected by advertising. So whether we like it or not, within the food systems, that within the food systems, and then within the food environment, there are a lot of pressures that affect the consumer and determine how we select our food. And ultimately, it influences our food, the quality of our diet, and therefore, nutritional status. This is a typical food environment in a country I visited last summer. There were big billboards advertising sugar-sweetened beverages. Sugar-sweetened beverage bottle is about 20 cents. A medium-sized watermelon is about two to three dollars. Now tell me, where a mother is in such a food environment, how do you convince her to feed fruits to her children 
when she can get some, an alternative that is so cheap. This is the kind of environment, food environment, that some people now find themselves. This slide just shows that you know, consumption of processed foods is increasing. I mean, if you look at the yellow side, that is the high income country, it's high already. But look at the percent increase in the last, in the, 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 the column on your right. You can see that the percent increases are high. It's low, but it's increasing very, very fast. It will not take very long for us to, to get to the other side. Now, this is a study that was published last year. I think it's quite interesting for us to see, you know, we are not aware how our food environment is being manipulated. It's being manipulated so much that we end up being drifting and eating a certain way. This is data looking at households that buy foods from supermarkets. And the data shows that households that buy from supermarkets, and this was done in Kenya, are more likely to buy fats, oils, and sugar-sweetened beverages, and were less likely to purchase fruits and vegetables and unprocessed grains. In the same study, which I think is quite unique, they actually link the study to the metabolic uh, syndrome. Basically, they found that those who bought from supermarkets in Kenya were more likely to be overweight or obese, experience pre-diabetic symptoms, be, have uh, prehypertensive, and also suffer from metabolic syndrome. This is one of the few studies that have linked our food environment, specifically uh, a, a certain type of purchases, because in many developing countries, when you go to the supermarkets, what you see are mainly processed foods. So this is one of the first studies that is linking this kind of food environment to this uh, uh, metabolic situation. Howdy, uh, you, show, uh, you showed this slide, I think you said it perfectly than I could ever say. But the message here is that, which he said it very well, staple crops are very cheap. The foods that we want people to eat more of, the fruits and vegetables, you know, the pulses and all, are much, much more expensive. And so that, I think he, he made the point very, very clear. Also, talking about the obesity situation, there is also a point that I would like to mention. And this is, you don't often see this being mentioned, but we were involved in a study, I was part of the study we, that we carried out to develop the WHO growth standards, the multi-center growth reference standard. In developing this, we looked at maternal uh, postpartum weight gain. You can see the line at the top, it, it's not very clear, but that's the line. We had six countries were in the study, you know, the countries are in Brazil, Ghana, India, Norway, Oman, and USA. After birth, most of the mothers you know, reduced, so there was postpartum weight loss. But among the Ghanaian population, which is typical of the African population, especially Sub-Saharan, postpartum weight loss did not come down. So considering that typically, most mothers who have about three to four children, after the first child, a baseline is set then uh, uh, after in the second, a new baseline is set. So by the time the mother has a third, second, third child, she has literally moved into overweight and obesity. This graph says the same thing. Well, in the USA and all the others, by you know, 24 months, six months, they've all gone to their non-pregnancy weight. In the Ghana mothers, they didn't actually lose the weight. We have seen this that uh, dietary risk factors have now become a major uh, cause of mobility, morbidity and mortality. I will not go too much into this, we've seen it already. There are global opportunities that we can use to address this and 
we have no excuse not to do something about our food environment and our food systems. We have the, decade, we have the sustainable development goals that we can use to make changes. We also have the decade of action on nutrition. We have 10 years to actually do something about nutrition. My last slide here, there's so many things that countries can do, this, that we have the tools, we know what to do. And some countries have already started doing something. We've heard about what Chile did. So on this note, I think I'll end. My time is up, but these are the key, notes, uh, uh, key points I want to emphasize. Thank you all very much for your attention.